am Maria Tusidibe and this is QTV News coming to you live from our studios along Karaba Avenue. Thanks for joining us. Here are the main local and international news headlines. Ahead of his trip to Accra, Ghana for the 59th ECOWAS Heads of State Summit, QTV managed to get an exclusive from President Barrow about his expectations for the summit. Gambia's Immigration Department refused claims it has halted the issuance of national ID cards. As the so-called mosquito season approaches, First Lady Fatima Tababaro has presided over a ceremony where fogging machines donated by the Rotary Club were presented. Over 400 soldiers have been promoted in a ceremony at Fajara Barracks. In international news, Kenneth Kawunda, Zambia's ex-president and the last survivor of Africa's independence leaders from the 1960s, has died at the age of 97. We look at whether Africa is on the verge of a third wave of COVID-19. Those were our main headlines. Now the news in detail. President Adam Abaro left for Accra, Ghana on Friday, where he will join other ECOWAS leaders for the 59th Ordinary Summit of the ECOWAS Heads of State and Government between 18th and 20th June. In an exclusive interview with QTV's Alu Sise, the president shares his expectations. Here is an excerpt. Your Excellency, safe flight. Uh, what's your expectation from this year's summit? Uh, thank you very much. Our expectations are very, very high. I think there are a lot of positive things to discuss, but as a block, uh, I think coming together and discuss our issues, sort them out amicably, I think is important. We will discuss uh, the single currency, we will discuss about the reforms, we will discuss about Mali. I think these are the main issues that we are going to discuss. But I think I spoke to some of my uh, ministers who are there, I think everything is positive. Thank you so much and wish you a successful summit. It's a pleasure. Safe flight. Thank you. The Gambia Immigration Department have refuted claims that they have stopped issuing the national identity card. The department further told us that, in fact, there are thousands awaiting collection. Babakarsi reports. According to the Immigration Department, a substantial number of Gambia and national identity cards are printed in various ID card issuing centers all over the country uncollected. This clarification came after rumors circulated that the immigration has halted rolling out of the document or have stopped issuing to citizens. This matters greatly in an election year when an ID card is one of the documents accepted for voters' registration. In a chat with the Immigration Department's PRO, he confirms to QTV that far from stopping, the ID card department have redoubled their efforts as they realize that more people are coming for the document. The ID card is once it's in progress. And in fact, um, as we speak now, I think, you know, we have redoubled our efforts, you know, um, to an extent that our officers are working beyond the official um, close of business. Um, when, if you take a walk around our stations around the country, you will realize that officers are working as late as, you know, 6 p.m., which is um, beyond the official close of business. Um, this is to ensure that um, we help the population to get their IDs so that they will be able to rightfully participate in whatever national event that you know, is um, forthcoming. And uh, right now, um, we are able to register you know, a lot of Gambians so far. The next question I put to him was about coping with the number of people looking for the identity card, as there is only one printing machine in the country, which is in Carnifin. If not halted, could this be the reason for the delay in issuance of the cards? Here is Mamandindiba again. All the cards that are you know, processed across the country are printed at one central location, that is at the Semlex headquarters. And that facility is also doing some other businesses in different from printing ID cards because the resident permits and the driver's license are all printed at the same place. I think the outcry um, that allegedly going around that you know people are you know talking about that um, the ID cards pickups are late and you know we are not issuing exorbitant amounts of ID cards. We have a lot of ID cards lying you know lying you know should I say I cannot say lying idle mm -hmm. but uh, lying you know just like that um, in our different outlets. 
you know, so many, many ID cards are printed as we speak. The ID cards, we have a lot of them that are ready for pickup, but no, the persons are not coming for them. I don't know for whatever reason. The immigration department has confirmed that more people are applying for the ID card, and this could perhaps be associated with the current voter registration on the way. Given the mostly unsubstantiated claims of foreigners being issued with IDs, how strict are they in making sure that applicants provide the documents required to get the ID card? Um, these laws have never changed and therefore our procedures have never changed. The requirements for ID card from day one you know, remains the same and it's still the same requirements that we are following. The ID card we keep on saying is for Gambians and Gambians alone and uh, um, we will ensure that you know, this ID card is given to Gambians and you know, not otherwise. Immigration PRO Mamanding S. Diba advises the public that those going to collect their cards as well as those assigned to collect cards on someone else's behalf must go along with original receipts to ensure the process is smooth and avoid inconvenience, dispute or delay. Babu Karsi, QTV News. The First Lady Fatumata Barbara on Thursday presided over the launching of two new fogging machines donated by the Rotary Club District 9101 to the Ministry of Health for the National Malaria Control Program. The donation of the fogging machines is part of the Rotary Club District 9101's aim to fight malaria as highlighted in their theme, Rotarians Against Malaria. According to the WHO, the prevalence of malaria disease in the Gambia has reduced significantly and the focus is now on strengthening surveillance at all levels. Only one West African country, Gambia's neighbor, Cape Verde, has eradicated malaria, doing so in 2018. So, it is achievable. Addressing the gathering, Dr. Emma Bruce, the chairperson of Rotary District 9101, said the machines were purchased by the Rotary District 9101 and partners at a cost of over $20,000. Say calls for collaboration in making the Gambia malaria free. We saw what COVID did. Um, although malaria has not surprised us, it's been here for many years, but we still have to pay attention to it. So that's why we feel it necessary to help out with these fogging machines. So now um, what's more important is that we need insecticides for these machines. So I'm appealing to other government agencies, private um, um, organizations, to also step forward and provide, help provide um, the insecticides needed for these fogging machines. Dr. Ahmadou Lamin Samate, Gambia's health minister, highlights government's efforts in fighting malaria, revealing that the prevalence of malaria disease in the Gambia has drastically reduced over the years. Since 2004, the sustained investments by the Global Fund and other donors have driven malaria cases and deaths to historically low levels in the Gambia resulting to a general decline in malaria incidence in the country by 50%. Admissions due to malaria in hospitals and health facilities dropped by 74%, and deaths attributed to malaria have equally dropped by 90%. Furthermore, the prevalence of the malaria parasite dropped from 4.0% to 0.2% to in 2014, and most significantly, the malaria prevalence has now declined even further to 0.1% in 2017. Highlighting the successes registered in the fight against malaria, Balakande, the program manager at the National Malaria Control Program, explains the strategic areas they focused on in fighting malaria. We've conducted about more than two campaigns in which we have distributed over one million nets. The other thing that we are doing as far as uh, strategies are concerned is indoor residual spraying where we spray houses up country around you around Sierra and then perhaps you know to make sure we kill mosquitoes that literally hide in those houses. The other thing that we normally doing is you know what we call seasonal malaria chemo prevention SMC where we ensure distribute uh, administer drugs to children 3 to 59 months. The launching also witnessed drama and singing by a traditional performing group on the importance of good sanitation and the use of bed nets in fighting malaria. Over the years, the Rotary has supported the National Malaria Control Program, especially during the National Insecticide Treated Mosquito Bed Net Distribution and in sponsoring malaria control and prevention awareness campaigns. For QTV News, I am Abiba Tusise. We will now take a commercial break. Still to come, we have more local and international news.
Kabuski Act Style 4.0 coming soon on QTV. Sponsors invited. <laughs> Welcome back. 403 soldiers of the Guards Battalion at the Fajara Barracks were promoted on Thursday to various ranks at a ceremony held at the Fajara Army Barracks. Loli M. Kamara attended the ceremony and she now reports. The promotions include 165 private soldiers to Lance Corporal, 181 Lance Corporal to Corporal, 53 Corporal to Sergeant, one sergeant to staff sergeant, one staff sergeant to warrant officer class two, two warrant officer class two to warrant officer class one. Addressing the newly decorated soldiers, the commandant of the Republican National Guards, Suro Jaune, said the promotion is in line with transforming the Gambia Armed Forces into a more viable and efficient force. There cannot be any meaningful development in the absence of peace and security. It is against this backdrop that training and capacity building forms an integral part of my vision for the Republican National Guard, which is to maintain a highly disciplined, morally upright, apolitical, and a well-equipped and robust Republican National Guard that will fulfill all her mandate as enshrined in the Constitution. Jaune for the states that Soldiers' performance during various training and capacity building programs will determine their eligibility for promotions and will also serve as a benchmark in successfully making it to the next rank. He advises those officers that are yet to be promoted to keep up the good work to be eligible for promotions next time. Lieutenant Colonel Abdullahi Mane, the commanding officer, Guards Battalion, said promotions in the military are significant achievements in careers, adding it serves as evidence of their commitment, mastering of duties and skills. Let me remind you that your elevation to various ranks was as a result of your dedication to duty, discipline, loyalty, hard work, and selfless sacrifice, amongst others over the period. And please... Be reminded that promotions come from Allah, the Almighty, and he does it at his own time, which is solely the best time for you. I therefore thank the Almighty Allah for granting us the strength to witness this important occasion. Once again, I say a very big congratulations to you all. Newly promoted Lance Corporal Asana Tubari gave the vote of thanks on behalf of the promoted soldiers. Promotion comes with a caliber of new responsibilities and challenges. We should all feel prepared enough to fulfill these responsibilities and overcome the challenges. We would also like to extend our sincere appreciation and heartfelt greeting to the Chief of Defense Staff, Lieutenant General Yakub Ed Rame, and by extension to the President and Commander-in-Chief of the Gambia Armed Forces, His Excellencies, Mr. Adam Abaru. The event was attended by the senior military officers from the Gambia and Senegal, as well as family members and loved ones. Poems were also read in French and English by the Fajara Barak School Grade 5 students. For QTV News, Lolly M. Kamara. Black set and code the African descendants community campaigning for the Gambia to accord them citizenship met President Barrow at State House on Saturday. More in this report by Babu Karsise, which is narrated by Emil Choi. Meeting the president is an important step for these African descendants who now reside in the Gambia, calling it home. They are on a quest not to live here as foreigners, but are campaigning to be accorded citizenship as Ghana, Sierra Leone, and other African countries have done. President Barrow told the community of African descendant members that he believes in the lyrics by the late Jamaican reggae musician Peter Tosh, who said, No matter where you come from, as long as you are a black man, you are an African. The president expressed delight in meeting them, saying he recognizes their status as Africans. The members were grateful that their request to meet the president was granted, describing him as awesomely inspiring. 
The African descendants were surprised to learn that the president watches the YouTube Black Seed channel dedicated to the positive promotion of the Gambia and Africa, and which has over 3.5 million views. In April of this year, the executive representing these African descendants met with 11 National Assembly members to discuss citizenship and developmental projects. Some of these supportive National Assembly members took part in a recent code organized seminar, and a few of them accompanied them to the meeting with the President. For these Black Seat and Court members, this is a great achievement and hope that it is the beginning of the road towards achieving their dream of being welcomed back home, not as foreigners, but as citizens. Mohamed Lamin Choi, QTV News. In international news, We have a look back on the political life of one of Africa's political giants, ex-Zambian President Kenneth Kawunda, who has died at the age of 97. For my generation, news of Kenneth Kawunda's passing is received with great sadness. In May of this year, I published an article celebrating the 97th birthday of Zambia's first president and a giant in the fight against colonialism. The article had the tagline, the only African independence leader from the 1960s still alive. Sadly, now he is no more. I was part of what I call a special generation of Africans. We were lucky enough to observe the emergence of colonial states on the continent into independent nations. British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, fresh from visiting several British African colonies, had delivered his now famous Winds of Change speech in Cape Town, to South Africa's all-white parliament on the 3rd of February 1960. By the following year, 17 African countries had gained independence. At school, my classmates and I could proudly reel off the names of the leader of every independent African nation, including, for example, Milton Magai of Sierra Leone, Dauda Jawara of the Gambia, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, Patrice Lumumba of Congo, Sheku Ture of Guinea, Modibu Keita of Mali, Lepol Senghor of Senegal, and, of course, Mr. Kaunda. Kaunda, the youngest of eight children, was a schoolteacher before joining the independence struggle. This is when he became known for his guitar playing, composing liberation songs and travelling the country to drum up support for the campaign against colonial rule. He went on to become Zambia's founding president at the age of 40. His wish, he said, was for Zambians to have an egg on their table for breakfast every morning and a pint of milk and for every Zambian to have a pair of shoes on their feet. The man, popularly known as KK during his presidency, was a fierce critic of apartheid South Africa and white minority rule in Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. And he allowed groups fighting these regimes, such as the African National Congress, to make Zambia their base. With Kaunda cause it cannot be unconditional hero worship, as, even though we accepted that he had made huge strides towards improving the lot of Zambians, we felt he betrayed the promise of democracy by introducing a one-party state in 1973. Mr. Kaunda was the only candidate in elections in 1978, 1983 and 1987, each time scoring more than 80% of the vote. Eventually, Zambians felt Kaunda had overstayed his time in office and voted him out in 1991 after mass protests forced him to reintroduce multi-party elections. Since being removed from office, Kaunda has largely kept out of politics and devoted much of his energy to fighting HIV after losing one of his sons to AIDS in the 1980s. Now, as he joins the list of dead liberation heroes, his legacy will remind us of the continent's history both good and bad, and we can learn from both. Kawunda was a true giant of African politics. For QTV News, I am Ade Darami. Germany's development minister is currently in the Gambia on a two-day state visit as part of a week-long visit to several West African countries to gain an insight into the region's fight against COVID-19. 
However, the visit comes as reports show an increase in daily cases, leaving many asking, is the continent about to witness a third wave? And Sumana Iswanyasi tells us more. What appeared promising and a battle likely to be won in the near future now seems to be garnering more uncertainty and worry than hope. The COVID-19 pandemic has not only ravaged even the world's strongest economies and health systems, but changed the way we live. With the first and second waves and several variants of a virus that continues to claim countless lives, the pandemic remains a global health emergency that has left the world's leading scientists searching for answers as to its origin and possible cure. The discovery and production of several vaccines such as the AstraZeneca, Pfizer and Moderna raised hopes that the world may soon resume normalcy after nearly two years of living under strict health guidelines and regulations which included the wearing of face masks and observing physical distancing. However, with reports of a third wave backed by an increase in cases and insufficient vaccines, especially in Africa, there is a growing fear on the continent. Germany's development minister, Gerd Müller, whose country was one of the worst affected during the first wave, has been supporting African countries in their efforts to combat the virus. Gerd Müller is engaging his counterparts on the possibilities of producing vaccines in West Africa. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, the director general of the World Health Organization, earlier this week told journalists the steep increase in Africa is especially concerning because it is the region with the least access to vaccines, diagnostics and oxygen. And conflicts in Ethiopia, Mali and the Democratic Republic of Congo are said to be exacerbating the situation. There is also a reported daily increase in cases in East Africa, especially in Uganda over the past month, having recorded 1,400 by June 15th, according to Our World in Data. The country is currently observing a 42 days lockdown. DR Congo's president also warned of a potential fatal third wave, leaving many worried and asking whether the continent is on the verge of experiencing a third wave. Antoine Eswanyasi for KTV News. Before we end this bulletin, here's a recap of our main news headlines. Ahead of his trip to Accra, Ghana, for the 59th ECOWAS Heads of State Summit, QTV managed to get an exclusive from President Barrow about his expectations for the summit. Gambia's Immigration Department refutes claims it has halted the issuance of national ID cards. As the so-called mosquito season approaches, First Lady Fatimata Barbaro has presided over a ceremony where fogging machines donated by the Rotary Club were presented. Over 400 soldiers have been promoted in a ceremony at Fajara Barracks. In international news, Kenneth Kawunda, Zambia's ex-president and the last survivor of Africa's independence leaders from the 1960s, has died at the age of 97. We looked back on his political life. We looked at whether Africa is on the verge of a third wave of COVID-19. That's all we have for you in this bulletin of QTV News. Do join us tomorrow for more news. Thank you for watching and have a nice weekend.